Hi, everyone. Welcome to our discussion of Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, also known as Blade Runner. I don't know why. I read the book twice and I don't know why. Mm. Uh, and this is going to be the fourth book that we're reading in our uh, SF Masterworks reading series. We read one every month, except when they're really big, we break them up across multiple months like we did for Cities in Flight. Uh, this is the book is by Philip K. Dick. Uh, sorry for to mention that. With me, I have the usual group of friends. Uh, Chris, would you like to start us off with introductions? Me, God, you caught me on the lines. <laughs> um, my name is Chris Mullen, sometimes YouTuber, but mostly just kind of do chats like this uh, about this book. And I have to say, this is of all of when we first thought about the series, I hadn't long finished reading this the first time, and I was like, I can't wait to get to this book. So here we are, nice. in November, before the, end of the year talk about it so we'll see there's a lot to discuss for sure yeah <laughs> robin <laughs> yeah sure hi everyone uh, i'm robin from bookends and biscuits um which is a youtube channel uh but yeah a lot of the time i just spend talking to really awesome other people like these guys uh first time i read the book love the film so yes very interested to see the the how everyone thought they compare okay. susanna uh, hello, my name is Susana Imaginario. I'm a writer and uh, I run a YouTube channel called Den of the Weird. And I spend a lot of time talking about books, and movies and stories in general. <laughs> Thanks to the page joining forums. Nice. And Jared. Uh, hi, I'm Jared. <laughs> I uh, run the Fantasy Thinker YouTube channel. And... Um, I also uh, haunt the page chewing forums and I write a blog on there called Creative Crossroads. That's a lot of fun. And we have a brand new guest today, Livia. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, I write text based interactive fiction. I have also write, uh, written books, but they are not published yet. And I also have a podcast called Books Undone, mostly to analyze books. And I'm also a member of the Page Two in Forum and have watched your YouTube channels for a while. So it's an honor being here. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> so, so we'll kickstart the discussion. I guess um, what I'd really like to talk about is to start talking about is the is the mood device that also has a setting <laughs> to make you want to dial it. <laughs> <laughs> So um, what did you guys think of that? I, I thought that was fascinating. There's a lot of like interesting tech. I, I only read two books by Philip K. Dick and both of them I thought have a lot of interesting seeming tech and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, someone who likes the book, please go first. Cause <laughs> <laughs> if I may. I Yes. Yep. <laughs> Something that I quite liked at that, uh, about the mood organ was at the start of the book when the wife, uh, Iran, she's saying that all the apartments are empty and it's so common that she kind of like lost the ability to feel anything about that. So she gets into a depression mode just to not forget and mm. still be able to be empathetic. And that made me think of how often something happens so repeatedly, so often that it becomes common and we stop having feelings about it, mm. positive or negative. And I thought it was quite interesting, not the fact that they were inducing that mood of depression, but that she was actually aware of the lack of feeling right mm. about it. And afterwards, she says that the way of getting out of it was using awareness of the manifold possibilities open in the future as if hope and having something to wish for are the way of getting out of the, that depression she induced. In general, it was um, quite an interesting opening for me, especially because it sets the mood of the world as well. It's so empty, so desolated, but it becomes so common that nobody thinks of it. Mm. It was no. fascinating to me, I have to say. <laughs> Completely fascinating to me, especially these first two chapters. He has so many ideas of the way like a dystopian society would operate or could operate. 
and taking like this one, this emotion box of the idea that, okay, I wake up in the morning and I want to feel insert emotion. Therefore, I will use a device, in this case, a technological device, but in some cases, it's also sort of drug, drugs induced to kind of regulate their hmm. regulate their emotions or their needs. And this, and and in his wife's case, Rand's case, she wants to wallow in this depression. She wants to live there permanently, maybe as a consequence of the world that they live in. The kind of the, the not wanting to live in that world, as as I think the book sort of explores as it goes through. Hmm. But that idea that, okay, we'll just go with this. But even stepping forward to that, like, you can't help but read that and then look, right, what's the equivalent in our modern society of mm. that? And it, I would say for our lot, it's that dopamine hit that social media and all that kind of stuff kind of gets. is nearly an identical uh, thing than what, that, what Dick represents in this book. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> like especially the dial three, is it three, uh, to make you want to dial, like you get notifications <laughs> all the time if you want to delete, it's like, are you sure you want to delete your account <laughs> and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, I, I also thought the wake up every morning, um, the alarm setting to make you feel joyful to wake up, that was interesting. So yeah. I wish I had that, yeah. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching a YouTube video by someone, uh, what every guy on YouTube versus me. <laughs> and, and then like, everybody has a school morning routine, and then like the person's just lying in bed, switching off their alarm 20 times. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, anybody else have anything? Uh, it's, it's a fascinating add? concept, the uh, <laughs> the mood stabilizer, or what the mood machine there. Um, it, it, it kind of if you have that kind of mood regulation that kind of machine that can kind of do that kind of thing for a person um it just makes people not that much actually closer to androids in a way because they're just being regulated in that manner mm. whereas an android probably has you know com, you know com, artificial intelligence mm. way way to regulate itself and uh i thought that was you know that that was the beginning of just a lot of the, a lot of the comparison and contrast in this book between humans and androids that that i yeah. really enjoyed yeah. and i love the uh mm -hmm. i love the the uh, the emotion right away put into non human things in in the book especially like the first the very first line where he gives you know the a emotion to electricity you know mm -hmm. the electricity is merry it's, it's a merry surge and it's like <laughs> well that's you know that's a human perception of a of electricity but uh it's uh right off the bat he's crossing the lines really you know right right there mm -hmm. yeah 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 i i loved the the beginning yes the concept of the the empathy box i was like oh this is this is brilliant this was not in the movie um it's always very exciting um and uh yeah i had high hopes i mean like chris said that the first two chapters are amazing it's like wow this is mind-blowing and and then it was a steady decline for me it's just <laughs> just kept, kept getting consistently worse um and i um i didn't reread i kind of skimmed tried to to understand you know why was it making me feel this way? I have some ideas, but um, yeah, the start, the that 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 whole concept of uh, that, that you can uh, fix your emotions or choose your emotions. Um, I, I thought it was brilliant. Yeah, I think I think overall, uh, my favorite bits of the book were all this exploration of what's real and what's not what's human and what's not and i i don't know that this is explicitly discussed but like can you allow yourself to have the arrogance to decide what's human and what's not when there is so much that you can't figure out like when isidore like sure he's a chicken head quote unquote but he can't figure out whether that cat is real <laughs> that ends up dying on his hands and um and and what's his name Deckard's neighbor didn't know that his sheep wasn't real the mm -hmm. owl they couldn't tell if it's real there's just so much going on there about 
and 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 I'm using the word real sort of loosely here. They are real in that they exist. It's just they're artificially produced. So there's uh, I really love that exploration, and it feels like it's something about our world, right? Like how we are so ready to deprive people of their rights because we think that some people are better or worse or less deserving and so on. So it feels like that theme is really woven in quite a bit into the book, and I really appreciated it for that. Yep. One of the things that really strikes me about that whole idea that you've talked about there, Varsha, is the fact that whether something's artificial or real, they have to do the same things anyway. So mm. the thing about the sheep, you know, the sheep that he has that's artificial and not real, he has to care for it as if it's real because he has to keep up his perception right. that it is real to everybody else. So in, in a lot of things in this book, it doesn't matter whether it's real or artificial because the end result is exactly the same as society, how they mm. contribute to society and all that kind of thing is yeah. identical. So actually it becomes mm. this misnomer as to how real or artificial something is. And, and I that's a fascinating point, Chris, because I found it hilarious hilarious that even in like this post-apocalyptic time you know <laughs> people are still worried about what their neighbors think and i found that ironic as yeah. well <laughs> why <laughs> that's the primary moving concern and yeah. <laughs> there was uh what is it it was oh god i forgot but Never mind, <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> Olivia was saying something, I think. Oh yeah, that I think that um, it ties back to what Jarrod said at the start, that even the emotions can be real or not, because if you are inducing the mood, is it truly real that you're, that uh, Iran is feeling that depression mm. or is it not? And if it is induced, uh, what is the difference to an Android's feelings? Because they are induced as well. and. As you mentioned, throughout the book, towards the end, we get more interaction from uh, with the androids, and they all have feelings. And is it real or not? And even one of the um, um, bounty hunters ends up questioning whether he is an android because the difference between "quote unquote" real and android is so blurry. Mm. On that, very interesting. Yeah, but that's. Um, so, but I was just going to say that, that that part of that whole keeping up with your neighbours and um, part of the show is to show that you are real, isn't it? It's all about having the the empathy and showing that I'm human, I care for something else. And that's why I was so surprised. I was not expecting the level of animals in this book that there were. I really was quite confused by that. But again, it, it links back to the whole thing of the, the you, you have to care for animals because it's empathy. And if you haven't got empathy, you aren't human. So that's where that, that, that all links in together, I think. So it's, it's, it's all about putting on a show just to show how human you are compared to these androids. Yeah, mm. but, but it's also shallow. It didn't oh, God, really yeah. care about well, when, especially when, when, when you got the the, the goat. Um, it didn't care. It, it just cared about showing off the goat, and then you just left the goat there. And, and I was like, "What are you gonna do? You're just gonna leave it there on the roof? What what the hell?" Um, it, every emotion. The, I sometimes question if they were feeling it or if it was just they just wanted others to kind of see it reflected on them. Um, and the the test, I mean, the psychologist in me was cringing the whole way through. Mm -hmm. This is not how you measure e empathy at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I guess it was deliberate. Um, there was a point where I was thinking, well, everyone apart from Isidore is an android here because there's no real empathy going on yeah. at all. And I thought yeah. that that would be, you know, the genius of the book. Even the writing, and that was what, what got to me and why I didn't enjoy it. I, I, I thought it was poorly written. Uh, it is a bit clunky at parts, but it wasn't that. Um, I was feeling very uncomfortable reading it because everything was so shallow. The, there was never a, a moment of introspection, a moment of um, let's talk about what just happened, of re reflection. It was just reaction, reaction, projection. Uh, and, and that made me very, very uncomfortable just reading that so, so shallow. So, yeah, that's upon reread, just to try to make sense. If that I, was I, the intention, brilliant. Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting, Susanna, as an observation, because I, I've read a couple of deck books now, and I feel like he doesn't do that in his books. Actually, 
mm. explain what he's thinking. I think the point mm. and the reason his books are kind of so short in general is because he kind of wants you to kind of put your own stamp there. And what does that actually mean? I think he purposefully doesn't do that. It just gives very, I think, simple examples. If, if there was a criticism I would have of this book is that he sort of beats the same point over your head multiple times, if you know what I mean, in terms of like, I, how shallow they all are at the end of the day. Like he doesn't, yeah. like every, that's kind of nearly everywhere. And in fact, the only point of real empathy in the entire book is probably his story with the spider. I mean, that's probably the only yeah. point of the entire book that's a real emotion yeah. that has been manipulated or moved upon. That was like a gut reaction from Isidore. And yet he's the guy that's excluded from society just as much as as the androids. You know, he's, he's busy living in a commune or out in the sticks somewhere, whatever way you want to call it, you know. Something that I wanted to point out of Susana's uh, comment is that it doesn't, that test they do, it doesn't really measure empathy. And that's true. To me, it was actually measuring more culturally appropriate responses because at some time they ask if the guy, um, it was about having a dish with oysters. And right now, mm -hmm. in our current world, like half of the population probably will be unfazed, the other half, if you are vegan, will probably be annoyed. And then depending on some of every reaction was on the on animals. There was one with a bear skin rug in the coach, and my reaction was like, okay, fake. And I didn't even pay attention to it. I thought that the rug was fake. And then the character explicitly says, Oh, she didn't have any reaction about the yeah. about the bear skin rug. But it's more, more of uh, how you look at it. Uh, if your culture is different, then you are going to have no reaction or a very different reaction. And that doesn't mean that you are empathetic or not. It's just like, as you were discussing, they are all shallowed down to a single interpretation of the world, to a single culture, right? And that's why, in theory, the test work not works not because they are measuring empathy as well. And I think it ties up to that shallowness that they reflect. Something that actually struck me is that Rick Deckard, the main character, he doesn't even reflect on the past. He doesn't seem to have a past. He never goes back and think like, oh, this happened to me before. Like, no, the only the only past that he thinks of is what happened at the start of the book, that he got notified that another bounty hunter had this and that. And it feels intentional at some point, as if part of demonstrating that uh, shallowness as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a certain lack of um, of world building here because it's you got to remember that the uh, it's it's a post apocalyptic world, and so I think animals might be rare, and that's why they're using them as that as that guide stick for for empathy because I think they're uh, they're hard really hard to get a hold of and they're very they're not as uh, accessible as they used to be in, in but ancient times that, but that's not empathy that's status yeah um i think it's supposed to be a uh an empathy for a life type of thing rather than um than a uh you know not, i mean and it is a status symbol too for for rich people to have mm. these things that have actual life but um but i i think that not seeing it it's not very well explained in the book, I don't think. Um, no, you are right there. It's, 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 it's an empathy for the waste of life. So the the way the bear skin rug would be a waste of a bear. The oysters, mm -hmm. you, how, how would you even eat them? Because they're alive and they're an animal and they're not around anymore. Right. Yeah. That's kind of how I read it as that's, well. Absolutely. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. <laughs> yeah, after, yeah, near the end, they actually mentioned that they have empathy only for organic things. Uh, and even for the plants, and then the androids go like, what about us? Because even the uh, chicken heads, or there is another person called Angel, they are not really explained. They are even worth less than androids. They are human, but they are not allowed to marry, not allowed to reproduce, and so on. And even they, uh, when the androids talk to this person, to Isidore, they even ask, he's like us, society doesn't care about him, doesn't care about the androids. So it's they are pushing that empathy only for some organic things, the animals, the plants, humans that are above the those quote unquote animal heads. Kind of the same point I was going to make, insofar as the joke of the book is that the one human trait empathy, if they actually showed it, 
they actually wouldn't be excluding anybody from society. They would find some way to integrate androids into society, to integrate specials into society. And therefore, the point that they are using to differentiate themselves from everybody else is the one the most that they do not ever explore or show in any in any way. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. It contradicts itself, right? Just yeah. by existing, it contradicts what it claims to distinguish. And yeah, I, I really appreciated the chicken head was the only empathetic one, or at least he wanted to go be friends with his neighbors and so on. Um, he is intellectually lesser, apparently, which again, could be some arbitrary test that we aren't really familiar with in the book. I don't think so. For all we know, it was a test that didn't really distinguish intellects versus not. But given that he's not allowed to be part of human society, even though he's very much possibly the most human person in the story. So that is really interesting too. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I had this idea that what's written in 68 or something like that. So a lot of the things that they're talking about there, one, are, can be more relevant today. But even things like, if you look at neurodivergent people in society, the very one thing that they're supposed to lack as well in terms mm. of, of ability is empathic nature as well. Uh, some people to a lesser or greater extent. But again, that could be a criticism that you're busy shunning and stripping society out of the diverse range of society and sort of trying to create this Aryan race. As, as that's why I just kept reading that kind of really every every chapter insofar as they were basically trying to create society, society into basically being all the one type or being all the one thing, which is what you do when you're threatened, I suppose, in, in some way, or trying uh, to curate society or feeling threatened by it. So. Mm. Yeah. I guess one way of looking at, so yes, the test separates from uh, like distinguishes people or they have all these tests that say uh, whether or not someone's human, whether or not someone can reproduce and so on. Uh, in the case of the Android test, well, what Deckard is trying to do is uh, kill people for killing their owners, so to speak. Right? So it's a bit like um, killing slaves for escaping uh their slavery, assuming if if they have enough sentience and self awareness to say, "I don't want to serve this person anymore," like you're you are lacking in empathy in doing that, right? So that I guess was another parallel, so to speak, with slavery. If I can take it a bit further, there is a part towards the end when one of the androids she's playing with a, a spider. The spider is an actual one, and she starts like snipping the legs of it, and that triggers the whole scene with uh, Isidore. And after uh, when I was reading the book, I was like, "That's awful! How can you do that?" Even if I, uh, you know, I'm in Australia, we have some ugly spiders here. But at the same time, I thought it was quite a childlike reaction. Like toddlers, very young, they don't have that understanding of that's an animal. They will slap a cat you know, and they don't do it because they are mean or not empathetic. They do it because they don't know anything better, right? So up to some, uh, up to what point is empathy learned mm. and based on the norms of our society or is empathy just something that we have naturally, right? Oh, it's, it's definitely learned. Uh, we were born like sociopaths. Uh, that's why, you know, the kid will slap the cat. It needs to be learned, learned by example and by experience. Um, babies, uh, they, don't, they don't care about anything but themselves, you know, when they're going to eat next. And uh, yeah, we, we were not born, you know, that social or, 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 or empathetic. But it is a good point. Like, like she was learning um how to to care how to to understand that different being yeah i think i, I agree with the learning thing because even if you think about it as you're saying earlier the different cultures have different reactions to different foods or how we eat foods or what animals you eat some people will be outraged by you know eating dogs or whatever and some people that's normal so it's completely learned and yeah it would be have to, have to be something that was kind of uh, if they were trying to ingratiate, I guess, picked up on as they go forward. True, yeah. It, it, and he also, I mean, that kind of brings up the question, like, because how do you detect when something artificial, when something's artificial? 
when it looks and acts so real. Uh, and that's part of what that machine, the empathy testing was supposed to do. But um, I mean, obviously it's not even perfect in this fictional, you know, science fiction manner. And it would, of course, it wouldn't be perfect in actual life either. <laughs> and uh, so I think that's, that's the question that he's probably playing with uh, throughout this book here. But hypothesis. So, because you couldn't tell the humans from the androids and the humans created the androids and the humans clearly had no notion of empathy at all. So the androids were just, you know, how they were created. So <laughs> the, I think what you need is a little bit of backstory. You know, what happened before all this? Mm. How, how did humanity got there? Uh, I think. Absolutely. You just got the glimpse. No, yeah, I, I, that, that's one of the things I struggled with this book is actually that you were just getting this. I was like, I want to know more about what's happening on Mars. Like, are the androids fine on Mars? What's that? What's that life about in there? Like, how? What's happening? <laughs> and um, beforehand, and obviously, there's a whole thing about how people aren't even meant to be staying on Earth. Like, they're staying there against the the, the general um, consensus that they shouldn't be, um, which I guess would be hard to give up on. Uh, but yeah, I, that's one of the things I struggled a lot was it was the, fa the fact that the book was so short and you only got this like tiny bit of information and far too many animals. <laughs> <laughs> the, there was one bit which for me was the most empathetic bit uh, in, in, in a way. It was at the beginning, I think it was Pris, when she was des describing Mars as being dead, that mm. you could feel that it was dead. I think it was one of the few characters that actually used the word feel or, or mm -hmm. expressed something in those terms. And, you know, and she was an android. And I and kind of got me thinking. And I thought the book went in a different direction and then it didn't. But uh, yeah, I still don't get what the author was trying to make, trying to do. Maybe just endless discussions like this. Um, but I still think mm -hmm. the, the problem was from the beginning lack of empathy. I mean, that test, I, I know the book was written in the 60s, but even back then, the test itself, um, yeah, it, it was making me cringe. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it was almost obvious, it was testing uh, the opposite, it was testing uh, the learning. Empathy, you know, some, as if empathy was something that you would kind of study, and then you'd have, oh, I should feel it for this and that and the other, and in these circumstances, yeah. um, nothing was natural or remotely human about it. Um, so, yeah. I did really love the reaction when he went to um, talk to the opera singer, and she was just like, "This is a dirty test. This is all about <laughs> pornography yeah. and women." And I was like, "Do you know what? She's not wrong." wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even yes. when the other woman, she asks the question like, are you asking me a death or are you asking if I'm homosexual? And it's like that because the question mm -hmm. was very weird. <laughs> exactly. But do, do you not so, think that's kind of the point of the test, if you know what I mean, yeah. is that it is designed to test empathy, but it's almost, it's written by humans in an almost machine learning like way. In fact, they can't define what empathy is, therefore they can't write the damn test to do it. And <laughs> Like the androids are just trying to pass the test. So when they get the new iteration of the Nexus robot, they're like trying to test the old test to see if they can beat the new test with the, with the new technology. And it's just like us trying to sit and somebody produces a piece of writing going, Was that written by AI or was that not? I mean, it's exactly the same argument. Mm. Same with the art that you see that's being produced. It's exactly, oh, I can tell this is AI art because the edges are too sharp at the side here. I mean, I know it was written in 68. It's psychologically not a great test, but it's also very accurate for how we as humans try and define what technology is. I just think that the whole thing was just like 1968 kind of look at 2023 society in a nutshell. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I think I, I did read it as the test being deliberately shallow or not very interesting. I don't and and I think that sort of became clear to me the second time I read the book, not the first time. I think the first time I was like, okay, that that's interesting. That doesn't really work for me. I don't feel like we should <laughs> we should judge based on just these criteria. <laughs> but given what I know about all the things that the book explores, I feel like that might almost be deliberate, especially in the context of Isidore, the chicken head, who 
is arguably the one who's most fit to be accepted into human society but is not um this feels like a similar statement like maybe the test that he took was similar to this one where we're just like arbitrarily almost just discarding people and saying you can't be a part of the society and the punishment is death or just complete segregation from everything but do you look at Deckard's faith in the test? I mean, there's a whole section around chapter 68, somewhere around that anyway, where Deckard is like, well, what if this test doesn't work anymore? Like the whole society is going to fall apart because this test is, is, is no good anymore. And even when the Rosen Foundation kind of fool him by saying, well, no, she's actually human. And he goes, oh, the whole game's up until he realizes that actually, you know, they, they had lied to him or otherwise. And it's like almost his faith has been restored. Then it's like, oh, okay, everything's all right. Now, because this damn stupid test passes mm-hmm. a litmus test of of, of detecting yeah. what it's meant to do in the first yeah. place. Yeah. Um, I, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. sorry. Oh, thank you. Uh, so even in that scene before that, he's actually discussing with his boss and saying that some people will not pass the test because of mental health because they experience empathy and show empathy in a different way. So uh, as a baseline, we already know that the test doesn't work and it works only on neurotypical people. And that's very interesting because in a more abstract way, it poses a very nasty question of, are they real? Are they human? We know that they are. We know that they are equally valuable, but the test making makes it seem that they are not. So that also, it's very... Uh, I thought it was cringe when I got to that realization on the while reading, but then it seems to be what the author was intending to put up because it's very organized. You get that discussion and then you get, oh, but it's going to fail on Android, right? So mm. Mm. It, it makes you, it brings you back to the question of why uh why are they hunting down these androids in the first place? What did the androids do? Uh how did they turn on their masses if they did? And, you know, what led to the development of, you know, they, they created this test for a reason because they, they wanted to find these androids and stuff like that. And um, I think it was mentioned somewhere that the uh, some androids did turn on their that, owners. That, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. But so there's a there's a fear there that these the androids have to be destroyed these particular ones um so that you know that leads to the creation of the bounty hunters and and the uh and the, the test however faulty it may be um so it, it seems like they don't have a better recourse i guess yeah and that uh, they explain very little that they supposedly killed their owners as a, but it's not yeah, very clear. It's, it's very clear. vague, and yeah, and that made me think of when has humanity not killed each other? Like <laughs> we have wars. Like I think I, I remember I read in another book like there have been only three hundred years of human history without wars. So mm. it's like we kill each other in a regular basis. So how can you? Uh, then hunt the androids based on that. Uh, well, we the, the, put up different penalties for yeah. humans. Why we can't pay, put up they, different penalties for the androids? Yeah, yeah sorry. The, they're the they're the new other. You know, they're the yeah. new the new threat. Exactly. You know, if it's post apocalyptic, you imagine that there's a lot of humanity is probably not around, uh, and whoever is left on Earth, they're subject to these like radioactive landscapes and what have you. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they're the new they're the new other. You know, they're the new the new thing to point the finger at to put your blames on and stuff like that. And without that, humanity can control its race, basically. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're right. I, I agree with that. I thought by the end I was just like, I don't really understand this whole hunting of them either. Or mm, I, I, yeah, because of the other and anything else. But they set up all of these bounty hunters and everything else. Uh, do they only live for four years? I was like, surely just wait. <laughs> they're not going to be around that they're doing there's a lot of effort they're just kind of hanging out in the badlands like yeah what, it's four <laughs> years <laughs> not that long it, it does make you wonder because to create something that is so close to human that the only way that you can tell is by testing the the bone marrow or something and um and you make it 
so short-lived and even so you spend a lot of time and resources going hunting them if they if it, why what bring what brought this about i would love to know that that's a good it question makes no sense. Yeah. but also like i feel like I i'm just thinking of this now but um is it also a bit of commentary on like what we like as humans because see th they did say that the company i forget the name started making these more and more realistic androids because they were selling better like each time they came up with a better product like it was because of the demand from the market and so the people who were moving to mars they wanted these human servants or human feeling or human looking servants to take care of them like because you could easily build something that's visually different and you know has metallic parts and whatnot uh, and do what you need to do to make the difference obvious but apparently humans want the human looking servants it seems like at least that's the implication i don't know if it's deliberate um that's a good point yeah. humanity has form for this though <laughs> like in this case it's, it's androids for sure but bees flies spiders don't live very long they're hunted <laughs> relentlessly by the human race, uh, uh, as an inconvenience. You know, it's 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 just a nature yeah, of human society that we are threatened by them. But they they reproduce a lot. The androids do not. So. <laughs> That's true. I don't, yeah. but I don't think it's the re the fact that they reproduce a lot until I find like a, a nest of spiders in my house, and then like honestly, the fear of God has descended upon me. <laughs> uh, it isn't it isn't until that moment that I go, oh my God, they're going to reproduce. It's just a uh, death to all spiders before that. You know, it's just <laughs> yeah. I spray um, my yacht every yes. year, and those mosquitoes keep coming back. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I think no. that Chris made a point there. It's about the fear. You know, we fear the spiders, mm. therefore we kill them. They fear the androids, therefore they kill them. Mm. Mm. That the robot revolution will take over the world. And just... Yeah, yeah and but... they killed one, so why wouldn't they kill more, supposedly? Well, that, but that's the thing. That when I read that line, because it is literally just a line where they talk about Roy and, and them just killing their their masters in Mars, like, you think what narrative purpose has that got a sense? Because I think that is put in there so the reader goes, oh, yeah, okay, they're justified in killing all the androids. And just that from that one line, the reader goes, they're justified. But again, that raises the question of, even if there are some bad androids who do commit murder, you can't, it's not enough to label an entire race or an entire kind of thing to say then death to them all, you know, because mm. of the actions of one or two. And again, there's any amount of examples that over history as yeah. well. I, I forget, was there some equivalent of uh, emancipation papers where like the owners could tell the androids you're free to go? Was there something like that in this book or am I imagining it? No. Um, anyway, like they don't actually do any research to figure out if they did the murder. Right? They just assume that they're on this planet and not on Mars. So they must have killed their owners. They don't do any investigations. Just you exist here, so you need to go. Uh, yeah, they aren't they aren't getting any rights, any due process. Wasn't Rachel free? Um, may I, maybe I'm confusing. No, she was she, referred as property, actually. Oh, yeah, property of the company. Of her company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, mm. she she was seducing, and yeah, the, we have to talk about the most lackluster uh, sex scene in in <laughs> literature. <laughs> <laughs> Just. <laughs> Why? What? Seriously, what? talk about lack of empathy. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's funny because before that happened, uh, when he uh, was talking about uh, Luba Luft, um, he said that sh that android had more vitality and desire to live than his wife did. And then uh, yeah. later on, they he was talking about the um the, how she because she's a uh she's in a she's in an opera or a play or something like that mm -hmm. and the opera and the play the you know like as an actor you have to you have to like not tell the truth and lot you know and stuff like that and it, he found it ironic that the android could hardly tell the truth anyways because it's it's an escaped android you know so they couldn't tell the truth about themselves for a fear of being caught and um so he makes all these almost emotional connections to these these androids that he's hunting down 
and then uh of course then then you know further on we get he makes a real emotional connection so to speak to uh with uh rachel <laughs> the android from the company and and is that relationship any different from someone who just doesn't love you back you know uh it was right. it an emotional connection though well it was <laughs> uh, it seems just sex honestly it was uh, it wasn't even it, it was just <laughs> kind of like we're both here <laughs> it was not a good i agree with you that was a, a terrible terrible sex scene so let's get on with it mm. it was I like well, was we're very glad here. there was no sexy time <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, the point about that, though, mm -hmm. I think is interesting is that for all of the advances in technology, all the advances and everything else came on, at the very base way to manipulate somebody is through sex. I mean, it's pretty much the thing that people have been doing in humanity for, for, for eons and eons. And actually, the androids had worked that out themselves that actually this was their ninth one or something that she'd done this with. In order to mm -hmm. gain sympathy for androids, she had basically been going around sleeping with all the bounty hunters. And only it had worked with all but one, which again showed you that was by far and away the most effective approach that they had to be able to do it is to create attractive females who were sexually active, which is uh, kind of yeah. a very sad indictment on society in its own right as well. Which, which is also interesting because they understand humans apparently a lot better than a humans yeah. understand themselves and humans understand androids. <laughs> well, the company does, they're, they're programmed yeah, by the company, that's true. right? Yeah. Yeah, I suppose the company does. Yeah. yeah, I suppose those are the people who really <laughs> know everything about human psychology. And yeah, it is that conversation in the very beginning where Decker tells the owner that uh, you could be more responsible. You could make sure that you create tests along with um, the new androids that you create. Which you know spoke to my software engineer heart, but also uh, <laughs> this um, <laughs> it's like yeah, you're not you're not really being responsible. It's like you you want these androids to not pass those tests. I I don't know if there's anything to read into that, but that was just interesting. Why would you? Uh, because because apparently the outcome is uh, shut everything down <laughs> if you mm -hmm. if it turns out that they don't pass a test so why wouldn't you also if you're trying to make them more real or human feeling why wouldn't you also make the test simultaneously i thought something similar i also have a software background and when i read it it, it reminded me of the in currently in ai when you do sentiment analysis there are some specific metrics to measure it and they are still trash like you can <laughs> still get a very high metric and it can still be overfit mm -hmm. right so it's like we have been failing at testing what we <laughs> generate for so long and it also made me think of how software can be so unpredictable as well in some behavior same thing with the androids right but humans can also be unpredictable so mm. it goes back to that thing that uh, theme that the books goes of is it real? Is it not? How much it takes for it to be real? And what does it mean to be real? Mm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's almost like the scientists going, we can, so we shall. <laughs> we'll make, we can make this more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also people want it, we shall sell it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> That's true. But that, that was the, uh, again, I think a very minor point when the Pat was brought a lot back and he thought it was artificial as it dead or not. And when he brought up this company, they basically made the make the point that if it's close enough, it's the same. You know, from a transactional or capitalist point of view, if I can give you something that looks like a real cat, the person might believe it's a real cat. And as long as that's the case, we're in the clear. We don't have any problems going yeah. forward, which I thought was quite interesting. I sense that in this uh, future post-apocalyptic society some of the rules are a lot more lax than they would be today <laughs> <laughs> as far as creations and like you said about um backups and being able you know, to detect yeah. what you make and stuff like that <laughs> that's true a lot less regulation <laughs> lot yeah. less uh, a lot fewer ethical applications and analysis as done right now yeah no <clears throat> One thing that bugged me throughout, well, one of the many things, but this one. <laughs> uh, so that uh, that TV show, I've been trying to remember mm -hmm. the name that everyone was watching. 
that I didn't know all, always word? had. Was it no, no, I'm talking in the book. Um, oh, okay, sorry. That, that, oh, yeah. The talk show. The talk show that <laughs> yeah, and it was on by like 23 hours a day and it was always the same guest. Mm -hmm. And did that at any point raise any flags, uh, questions, <laughs> how? Um, you know, it, it was just there and no one... We were hunting androids and there was this thing on that never repeated. It made the point saying, you know, the, somehow the conversations and it never repeated. And, and, and what? Please elaborate. <laughs> so I, was, I was waiting for an explanation, elaboration and nothing. Was everyone oblivious that clearly they weren't humans or that wasn't real or what the hell was going on? What is your interpretation? I think it was that they didn't really care because the only person that actually poses those questions is the quote-unquote chicken head. Like the other people, they don't really care about the, jo the that show. They don't uh, put up any questions about it. And he's the only one who goes with all those questions. And I thought it was quite rhetorical for the reader to actually realize before it is presented on the book. So that means of to what ends are... To what extent are we going to, are we willing to go if we just want entertainment, right? They create the androids as entertainment, as basically slaves for them, servants, and then they create them for the show as well. Mm. So, yeah, that is how I read it. Yeah, I thought it was kind of a an interesting metaphor for the uh, TV will rot your brain kind of kind of attitude they had back then, you know, because TV was the was the internet of today basically you know <laughs> i mean i mean i think it is again you know, along alongside that other stuff with his wife and the kind of way she'd plug in the emotion box all the time to switch off to regulate her emotions rather than have any real experiences it's the kind of how soulless and lifeless humanity's existence is going forward like a, on a day-to-day -day basis there doesn't doesn't seem to be any like drive of industry there's no drive of anything going on we basically the only characters we have are bounty hunters and some police and you know that kind of thing there's nothing else going on in society in a post-apocalyptic world so like is humanity just dead at that stage and the fact that there might be a 24-hour tv show i mean in that case i might just watch youtube all day as well just <laughs> else, you know yeah i agree it didn't didn't describe it like what what was she doing i guess she was being a stay-at-home wife but like it, it made the it made it very much seem that that's exactly what everyone was doing. You're right. Yeah. They weren't doing anything else. They were either on their emotion box or watching this awful, awful TV or not looking after their many animals. Like it just wasn't, yeah, you're right. There was nothing else to that world <laughs> at all. <laughs> yeah. There was, um, that was a great uh, metaphor for TV, but also now for AI generated content that, you know, apparently you don't need people to write stuff for you anymore. Mm -hmm. You can just go infinite scrolling on social media but um i was i i mean it was very obvious to me the second time i read it but i was trying to figure it out the first time i i did wonder if it's m more ambiguous than it seems like for instance we only have isidore's perspective telling us that nothing ever repeats so maybe he hasn't noticed that it has repeated or it's from like if it's been on for years they're replaying something but um yeah that that's just like a very mild point of ambiguity. I think overall on a reread, it's pretty clear that they are supposed to be androids producing uh, content. And and what about Mercer? Um, and then especially towards mm. the end, the end just I just yeah, threw the book across the bed. It's like okay, <laughs> that. that um, uh, why please someone explained i even went online to just please explain this to me and i found a few theories but i would like to ask you guys because that that caught me almost completely off guard i think it just derailed i didn't see any any foreshadowing any any reason for ending the way that it did maybe i'm just you know dense and i was tired by then but um it just why <laughs> Are you talking about the reveal that Mercer's essentially mm -hmm. made up? Is that the okay? No, that that he um, was thinking himself at that at that point, and he found the toads and the whole thing. Um, yeah, that was a little weird. Right at the end. Yeah, 
it, yeah, it, it just I, came out both, of the blue. Yeah, both times I read it, I, I still think that bit's clunky in the book. I don't think there's any, any doubt about it. I think he was trying to use it as a, like, there's no established religion. Uh, creating the morality mm. that we would have, that would have been in 1960s society, and so this replaced it. And all it seemed to do in the book was create this again moment of crisis for Deckard and, and others, basically saying, "Well, if this isn't real, then what? Where's our moral center?" And as long as people could be fed a little bit of a lie to say, "Oh, don't don't worry about it, everything's fine," they'll go, "Okay, we'll go back to the mercerism and this kind of metaphor of struggling up the hill and getting hit over the head with a rock or whatever it was, you know, that catharsis mm -hmm. we're going to do. People just wanted to believe in something, of the, some sort of direction in life. But I, I do agree, it was it was extremely clunky both times. I thought the second time I read it, it would make a lot more sense. Uh, but I've, uh, I got exactly the same thing out of it the second time. I came up oh, with a theory you. about it. I, I, I read it and then came back to it. And my idea was the following. If everybody is so dead inside because they don't think of the past, they don't think of anything, then and the only actual human experience they get is through that empathy box, then it makes sense that Descartes actually has no sense of identity. Mm -hmm. And the only identity he can actually get is that of Mercer, who is a person that links them through it. So it's not like he becomes Mercer. He thinks that that's the only way for him to be human, to be real and have empathy after everything he went through, killing all these androids that perhaps are not that different than us, right? I thought it was a bit convoluted. I'm not, not quite sure or sold on my own interpretation of it, but I was kind of like trying to make sense of it. Yeah, the, the note that I had in my thing here is that the Mercer box is a bit like social media today. Like when social media goes okay. down for an hour, everybody runs okay. about going, well, I... I I don't have justification for my own opinions then it's that's that that joker that thing that's on the thing says this news is just broke could i have your immediate reaction to it and the guy says well what's somebody else saying about it online and it says well no, nobody's heard it yet you'd be the first person to have a reaction he says well i'll wait until everybody else has their saying then i'll tell you what i think <laughs> i think it was kind of i think it's kind of that idea that 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 mercerism was kind of clipping because they were crowdsourcing emotional thought if you know what i mean they were kind of experience and each other's joy, each other's pain, each other's depression through through that kind of vehicle or technological vehicle uh, to do. And without that, they kind of were like, oh, I'm going to have to have real emotions. I'm going to have real empathy. Again, this idea that humanity is lost in a, in a in an emotionless society without kind of AIDS, whether drugs or technology. Do that. <laughs> okay. Well, to, to give a little bit of history, uh, because it says Mercer had told him that the year empathy boxes first appeared on Earth, had told him that you shall kill only the killers. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's that was his uh, you know his big uh, commandment, I guess. Um, and uh, then it, Mercerism then evolved into a full theology. The concept of the killers had grown insidiously. Um, so the and in Mercerism, the absolute evil plucked at the threadbare cloak of the tottering, ascending old man. But it was never clear who or what this evil presence was. Um, so it and it goes on a, a few more, you know, lines like that. So that that was near the beginning of the book. And um, so there's does what's his name? Not Bunny Hunter. Um, Decker. Decker. Is he then later on in the book? kind of emulating that those thoughts those kind of those kind of ideas is he having some kind of toad vision <laughs> yeah the toad just came out of nowhere <laughs> but but there also seems to be no government and no other direction for humanity again i mean that doesn't seem to be exactly. like anything that's that's doing them so it, it seems to be mercer or nothing you know yeah. yeah, police, pet shops, um, not, not not even like restaurants, uh, yep. any other shops. Uh, I mean, how do people, you know, get their furniture, their food, their, their uh, the whole thing? <laughs> like, it, it it reads like a first draft at at points. I, I thought it was very lazy. I don't know. Cut me off. I want to hear in detail about the parts of the book that didn't work for you. But before we move on from the topic of Mercerism, um, I, 
Yeah, uh, you compare it to social media, Chris, but I, uh, and I agree with that, but also the other thing that I thought it was very similar to, it's just like religion, right? Yes, it is a religion and a faith and whatnot, but one, how it excludes <laughs> if you don't have an empathy box and you have to prove that you're a better practitioner uh, by like showing off that you take better care of your animals. Like there's a certain amount of, um, what do you call, uh, uh, performance, I guess, uh, to some aspects of like the organized religion. So it felt a bit like that too. Like it, it is explicitly a religion. So like that comparison's not really like uh, <laughs> clever or anything. But it's it. I feel like it's making a point by not being one of the real world religions. If that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I think the entire book and maybe others didn't read it this way but i think it's a takedown of capitalism and, and far-right society you know mm. gone go mad actually and a lot of those a lot of those ideas and the control etc that's going along there again this fascination with status in a world where everybody's dead mm. <laughs> you know what i mean there's nothing but space there's no there's like they're trying to control <laughs> population when there's nothing but space around the world yet there seems to be like this push of right kill all androids we'll exclude the specials for, from this as well like there's no reason for population or otherwise to do that but they but they are going to do it anyway but yeah. there but, but but the population control i think and the and the chicken heads is uh, actually a uh, um an outcome of the radiation isn't it so they say that the loss of iq and the fact that they couldn't have kids they weren't saying that you couldn't do it because of whatever it was because you had been infected or you'd been irradiated so that maybe your sperm whatever with the lead cod pieces was no longer viable so i think that wasn't necessarily them going you're not good enough that was them saying you've been irradiated you therefore can't have kids but so, isn't it the same point as I am legend then? You know, where, where at one stage who is the monster and who's who's the you know, it's yeah. uh, again that, that same point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but you're you're right for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it, it does also like uh that that makes sense, but is it also a sort of exaggerated metaphor for I forget the name of the thing, but where was it eugenetics where you chose the genes that work and are good and only those people are allowed to uh procreate. Um, yeah, but also if, if you if you're medically if you've been affected by radiation, that's not them choosing that's to true. not. It's yeah. more of a you 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 know you've been damaged, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Okay. Yeah, I I'd, I'd like to hear from you, Susanna, what parts didn't work for you. <laughs> I've been eager to hear that <laughs> all all afternoon. <laughs> Uh, well, I used to read a lot of you know um, drafts and and uh, manuscripts. Still on you know, I used to be a, a a better reader, and it kind of read like you know, like an, an unfinished manuscript throughout. Uh, apart from the couple, uh, the first two chapters where it, it did you know was polished and it felt like it was going somewhere, and then it was a a steady deterioration of um, in in plot and character and and everything and i mean it it had to be intentional to some degree i mean the book's been around for so long but it and also that there were bits that made me quite angry because it was so arrogant because a book like that today would not be published and if it was self-published you know oh the author would not hear the end of it um so so that was a bit frustrating and it was frustrating to read and just try to understand the story when there was so many gaps so much missing and there was no background no no structure i like to fill in gaps don't get me wrong but it it was a bit too much that with the story itself with the with the lack of empathy throughout I, it was a very unpleasant read i don't I have no way to, to put it. it it wasn't difficult it wasn't strenuous but I felt very uns unsatisfactory. I mean, it, it just it did work. I was always with a sense of, uh, you know, dissatisfied. Yeah, the, I think it's the the best way to des describe. You know, um, I felt like I, I, I didn't quite accomplish something. Not even to reflect. I didn't went away to reflect upon the story. I was just trying to, you know, 
understand what I, what I just read as if it was uh, homework. But, I mean, brilliant concepts at, at the beginning. I, I, would, I know it, it is a, a post-apocalyptic set, but I mean, I, I would love to have like a whole building to myself and, you know, the next door building <laughs> on the other side. <laughs> I mean, that sounds great. I mean, just the amount of space um so much that could be done i don't know and people's motivations and goals were just so narrow so narrow in this big space um which I, I thought it was very interesting in the beginning and you know so much to to work with you know brilliant idea and but it wasn't developed it wasn't fleshed enough so usually movies they tend to be to be disappointing compared with the books. In this case, I think the movie was ooh, so much better. Uh, if that was what they had to work with, uh, brilliant. But uh, yeah, so yeah, that that was my rant about um, the prose and just uh, the execution of the idea itself. What, I think it fell short. What was better about the movie Blade Runner? Well, th there was a lot more going on, for, for, for one. There was actual um, plot, I think, <laughs> made sense. Um, I do think it's an overrated movie, <clears throat> apart from the, the ending, which is, you know, one of the most brilliant scenes in cinema ever. Um, and I think the movie, the whole movie was kind of carried on on just that scene. But seriously, compared with the book, with what, with, with the source material, yeah, they they uh, they did an amazing job. No, even the test was better. Same. <laughs> yeah, it's curious. Yeah. I, I I like both the movie and the book, and but I definitely agree that if they tried to make a movie of the book, it would have been terrible. Like this, this mm. book is a movie. Just I don't think would have worked it in any way. And they basically took the bits that they thought were the, the big questions out of the book, or the bits that they liked out of the book, and decided to develop that in in, in some ways and kind of go along again. Sort of come to the same idea that it's about empathy and what is empathy and kind of how can you detect empathy, what is life and all of that kind of stuff, but kind of arrive in a different place and put it on. I I. I can understand why somebody wouldn't like because all Bill K. Dick's books that I've read have been like this just 200 pages of ideas or 150 pages of ideas, and then a, a book's over. There, you're done. There's not really <laughs> anything to put to pull it together after that. But I'd, and sometimes I'd much rather read the 200 pages of ideas with nothing else to go off than and try and build a plot around it for another 300 pages and then be going, oh, God, whatever. But, but I do accept that it, it is cold. There's no doubt about that. Like, and for a lot of people, that's not what they're looking for. No reason. Is it? Okay. Sorry, go ahead, Livia. Or Robin, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so many people meeting at the same time. No, I was going to say, I think I, um, the, one of the really reasons I liked the book was because I liked the film. So, mm. like, I was, I was really enjoying being like, oh, that's kind of where that is. And oh my God, that wasn't in it at all and everything else. But I just, I don't know. I think the yeah. film I watched when I was younger in like my formative years. So it's got that kind of like nostalgia for me. Um, and it's really, really good. Mm. And since, cinematography it looks like the whole how it looks and how it's done is really good but yeah I think I would have struggled more with the book for sure had I not enjoyed the film mm -hmm. I think so no, yeah because I agree it's yeah. a lot lot of ideas but I think a lot that's the I've always said that with the um sci-fi masterworks it's one of my main issues with these older books is that it's all ideas not much else Story. going with it yeah, yeah, yeah for a lot of them for a lot of them that's yeah, what yeah, it's completely fair yeah. uh, mm. it's par for the course as far as what we've read yeah. so far that's yeah, how exactly. it's been pretty much exactly <laughs> yeah yeah i i kind of that, that sorry. oh sorry go no ahead. go ahead go ahead Olivia. yeah <laughs> sorry so something i really didn't quite like in this book was how women are presented it's like it's a speculative fiction and can you please speculate about society as well, not only about the technology, you know, but it also makes a point of uh, they are discriminating about everything. They are discriminating about a specific group of people, the animal health, they are discriminating against the androids. Why not women? It's something humanity has done for quite a long time. But the, for example, the scene, the sex scene with the android, that was like too much 
object on one side, you know, human, a woman made an object to the extreme. I thought, I understand perhaps what the author tried to do. I just think that he could have done it in a more elegant way, you know, trying to strip, you know, the sexism mm -hmm. out of it and make it more part of a plot so that it feels more blood and uh, uh, something related to it than a mouthpiece. And there are other books that are, I think, a bit better at speculating on society, but the message on this one is quite dooming of humanity will always be humanity and within the same parameters, you know? And uh, yeah, that's, I think, the, the thing that I didn't like. And regarding the movie, I watch both movies. I love them both. I think that's why the book didn't rattle me that much, but I think it's a book that needs to be put down taken again after a few days so you can just go and i don't know see it with an, another light mm. perhaps mm. definitely with the, the 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 um what am i trying to say my brain the, the part about the sexism also i did um did anyone else the one that i highlighted on this was when he was tuning the mood box for his wife and then mm. saying yeah, that it was the, tuned the to yeah about what was the actual, I can't remember what the actual wording was, but how that she was like thankful for being a wife or something. And Understanding she, for the it. husband's infinite wisdom or something like that. Yeah. It was very, oh. And it was quite mocking <laughs> as well at the same time. It was yeah, annoying. Exactly. I love the way she's like, I dialed out of that immediately <laughs> as well. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no point to say as well that the film was, um, was bashed as well for that terrible sick sex scene in it with them. Um, uh, with Decca, that was also not done particularly well in the movie. So mm. Mm. Uh, that didn't bother so much. Uh, the the one that annoyed me was so his wife was depressed and you know dealing with her the best way she could, and his excuse for going and buy the goat and spending all the money and the increments was that was his answer for his depression was to you know get them in death. And and she was like, well, okay, I'm happy you got it. Yeah, you know, I'm just going to leave it there. That whole scene, oh, well, the amount yeah. of uh, um, WTFs and, and Fs that <laughs> went around when I was reading. Yeah, it's like they just... spend the whole book talking about empathy and then they just go and make the most irresponsible thing of getting an animal on a whim. Yeah, like... it, yeah and... and it, because you know it was his answer for depression. It was oh because I, I need to show this to my to my neighbor, you know, because now I got this and I'm not depressed anymore. And I just oh, mm, yeah, it's that it's that weird hierarchy, isn't it, Susanna? Of like you can have a sheep, but an owl's like way better than a sheep. And then they're like a really very goat. And then he might have found a frog, and like a frog would be like the best thing. It's like when your yeah, kids but, say, but it's just. You got, and and not to be you know uh, the opposite of misogynistic. Uh, I forgot the word, but it, it is kind of the way I've sometimes men deal with depression. Is you know they go and and spend and buy stuff, and women just have to you know remain depressed, and you know drink or whatever, and be happy. <laughs> I'm so glad you got there. You're feeling better. Yeah, that's that's great. It's just oh. <laughs> Nah. See my see my midlife crisis car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, a, I like, I've, I've seen the armor I wears. I'm taking up drinking. I'm bad. Nothing else. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I've I've read one other book by PKD, and there is a. I think the best word to describe it is bimbo. There is a bimbo character there too. Like there's someone, a big-breasted female, who's there whose apparent role is to just confuse the male protagonist, which is what Rachel was in this book. And so I I want to read more of his books to see if that's like a general running theme he has going. That was also one of the reasons why I came up with my theory about like really poorly written, uh, like, you know, over-sexualized female. But I don't think that's really a new thing, right? It's just something that was written about a lot, at least in the 60s and 70s. So... Anyway, yeah, if you've read Ubik, there was a character in there too that I did not appreciate at all. <laughs> Ubik's coming up in our, in our mm -hmm. rotation, although I have to say, I, I, it's one of the parts of the SF Masterworks I'm really worried about long term is that I do not expect very well written female characters 
uh, very yeah. much throughout this whole period. Like that is something that I am sort of quietly dreading. Yeah, yeah. I, I just have sort of resigned myself to like, yeah, roll my eyes and move on. Although sometimes it's difficult. Uh, like I, I against all of your better advice, I am still continuing on with cities in flight. <laughs> and my oh, God. Oh, why? <laughs> <laughs> Why? Oh, 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 oh my god. <laughs> Why? I'm, I'm just going to be Susanna for a moment. Why? <laughs> okay. Uh, there was a couple of things that I wanted to bring up. Uh, so in the very beginning, at the end of the first chapter, he just basically tells you everything that's going to happen in the book. Did you guys notice that? I noticed it on my reread. Uh, what he says... Hey. Yeah, it says the bounty from retiring five Andes would do it. He realized oh, yeah. $1,000 a piece over and above my salary, then somewhere I could find. And then blah, blah, blah. He says the main bounty hunter needs to go out of commission and they all need to move into this location <laughs> in Northern <laughs> California. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like <it> just <laughs> So I guess you don't care about plot that much because you're just telling us all of it now. Now let's go off and explore the idea. <laughs> I, I thought that was funny. I, I missed that. I'm glad that I missed that because otherwise I've been even more upset. Uh, and then the other thing that I wanted to talk about was uh, in Isidore's introduction, when he describes the silence, I thought that was so beautiful how he talks about how well, the summary is that the silence is really loud. It's a big paragraph, so I won't read it, but I, I thought a lot of the descriptions of silence, of the quality of silence that they have to deal with now that everybody's moved out. I thought that was really beautifully mm -hmm. done. Um, yeah. Yeah, he did I have think... a, quite a few good passages where he yes. was, when he described the world mm. and it was like made it interesting and it made it, it made it, uh, it made you want to discover more and read on about the world. Yeah. Um, until like, until like you said at the very end, we we got into the Mercer head, and then it was uh, a little wacky then. But uh, there, mm. there, there was some, there was some, there was some good passages in here. You know, yeah. Some yeah. some brilliant points in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he didn't. So I mean, I guess maybe it's my reading of uh, Malazan and now Backer that's influencing mm -hmm. this. But like, I would like more like spend time on fleshing that out. But I think these SF masterworks, like they're so short and they just present an idea. And like you do all the thinking that normally maybe <laughs> in recent times a character would do that for you, sort of. Um, th there was one other thing. Um, so to your point, Susanna, about the, the large buildings and all the empty space that you could do a lot more with, I wonder, um, yes, it is fairly narrow, but also... I'm thinking this, everybody who's left behind on Earth, they're sort of just dealing, right? They don't want to do anything more. They're sort of like humanity as a whole is depressed, if you will, because they're, they're not the ones who are going out and looking for a better life. They just want to do the best they can with what they have left, which would include like <laughs> not trying to go and sort of fan out and do more with the space they have. It's just like, oh, I just want a semblance of my old life back. At least that's, that's how I... I'd read that, but yeah, it, it makes sense. Like, I guess there's two ways of looking at that as well. Maybe more. <laughs> uh, is there any other? Sure. Yeah. yeah. I think the only other point that I wanted to bring up about the um, Isidore, the chicken head guy, wasn't it? Well, he talked about the silence. It was also, I really loved the discussion. I know apparently it was from Mercer Religion, but about the kibble about mm. that that slow takeover of all the stuff and i just thought that was a really um interesting idea especially because <laughs> like when you're in your house and your house slowly gets more and more untidy and tidy and you have to keep over it but the idea that that was like a religious thought yeah. i just thought that was really cool and how like at the end of things kibble's just going to take over everywhere when everyone's dead <laughs> so i thought that was yeah. beautiful i really enjoyed that yeah. Yeah, I, I wrote down a note against that passage that this is the excuse I'm going to use with my husband when I leave plates lying around and they magically multiply <laughs> overnight. <laughs> I just doubled overnight. I had nothing to do with it. I didn't like snack at <laughs> snack at midnight <laughs> and leave them lying around. <laughs> I should all try that. 
(laughs) 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 Any other closing thoughts before we call it done? I I did like the, um, there was an observation that uh, Decker made later on uh, about how he didn't like the way the androids gave up. And that was the difference between humans and androids in his mind at that point was that humans had billions of years of evolving of trying to survive and that Mm -hmm. fight to survive and androids hadn't they hadn't had that and uh that was like part of the reason why he won that final battle with those androids was that he had that survival instinct and they didn't Mm -hmm. that was one of the one of the differences that uh mm-hmm. that was actually more telling than some of the empathy testing he was doing <laughs> yeah yeah self-preservation because we will do quite a lot of things for self-preservation that the mm-hmm. androids don't seem to have even the you know the gun scenes the gunfight it seemed like so easy you know like they wouldn't fight back and the first one it kind of rattled me but after that i reached the same conclusion that it was because the androids didn't really, they saw that they had lost, that the probabilities perhaps of success were low. That's it, they didn't try it. So that's why the gunfight scenes were so simple in general. But it's like the whole book is always discussing that. And I think it's, as Robin said, one of those books that you read a bit, that's it, do a lot of thinking. It's not written Mm -hmm. in the page. You think that I, I'm not disagreeing with you. I think that that is a very good point. I always, but I also saw it as, um, well, the android didn't have, firstly, they didn't have to grow, but also they they knew, they they were much more aware of their own mortality and their limited time, and just that their existence was disposable um, and short lived. So they, they were a bit more pragmatic um, about death, you know. Oh, it's it's here now, but I knew it it was coming inevitably. And humans do that have that. Um, sometimes it's not um, so much a survival instinct; it's more a denial. Um, and even because they were, the the way they were living, I know they were just making do with whatever they had and. You know, just drawing off their pets, but uh, yeah, the, that that wasn't. Uh, the, there was no sense of self-preservation the way they were living. They, they were just denying death. I don't know. It it, but, it it works both ways very well. So I I just didn't see it that way. And just yeah. well, denial is very powerful. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, that very well could be part of tied into evolutionary. Uh, survival. <laughs> Who knows? You know. And and do you think yeah, the it's... androids were programmed to not want to survive? Uh, because you know, if they, yeah. uh, because the circumstances in which they might be hurt, other than like a really abusive master, is like if they were potentially like mm-hmm. the, the reasoning could go that <laughs> they have become dangerous, so it should, it should be, be a... easy to. Yeah, it could be programming or or a lack of programming, maybe. Yeah, you know, that, that, yeah. They, that's they, they wanted to leave. They wanted to leave more than the humans wanted to, to mm. some degree. That, that, that's why they left. That's why they rebelled. And, you know, they went looking for something better. Yeah. And then, oh, oops, it didn't work. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Indeed. And another very bleak outlook at human future even after an apocalypse can't get the shit together (laughs) 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 seems reasonable (laughs) Uh, any other thoughts or we can do outros I don't know why I said that like it's the most exciting thing but uh, (laughs) Livia would you like to start us off I never done this before, so I'm not sure how you do the outros. 
Oh, so you say uh, basically where people can find you, your uh, content, your books, your apps, etc. <laughs> oh, for sure. So I'm here in YouTube. My podcast is here on almost every other platform as well. I have Twitter, Instagram, and Threads, so all as Livia J. Elliot. And you can also find me on Google Play. So that's the app where my text-based interactive fiction is. So, yep. We can go clockwise, so Jared. Ah, okay. Uh, <laughs> once again, you can find me at the Fantasy Thinker YouTube channel. And uh, I'll be lurking on the page chewing forums all the time, so you can find me there. Mm-hmm. Page chewing as well, or Den of the Weird, or on X as Chronodendron. You can find my books everywhere. Um, the first one is only 99 cents now on Amazon. Mm. And it's called Weird Gods. It's Weird Gods, yes. It helps. <laughs> Thanks, Bart. <laughs> you can tell that I, I am great at this. Yes. Yeah, I, I finished the first book and the second book is going great. I have... Uh, yeah, listen to the audiobook if you like audiobooks <laughs> because the narrator is brilliant. Um, oh. And also, I forgot to mention, I loved uh, Livia's unearthed story, so check those out. And They're really Robin, good. <laughs> Robin, you're up. <laughs> I have I have no books, but I think I will pick up uh, these two guys' books. That sounds very exciting. Uh, but yeah, uh, the, on my YouTube book and um, biscuits, mostly sci-fi and crime. And uh, I am also on X as well and on the pastry forums. And me, I have a YouTube channel that's mostly talking about movies at the moment. So um, maybe not going there for book content at the moment, but we've got top 10 lists coming up in the next month. So, you know, that nice. will be, I'll, I'll do one of those for sure. Uh, otherwise, you can find me in the page chain forums. Uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> cool. Uh, you can find me on my YouTube channel, Reading by the Rainy Mountain. I uh, hang out on the page chain forum all the time. Uh, you can message me there if you'd like to try. To, <laughs> if you'd like to try to reach me, the about page has other ways to reach me. If you don't like that, if you would like to join us on these discussions, either here on the actual discussion or on the forum via, you know, text discussions. Uh, the next book we are reading is The Stars, My Destination by Alfred Baxter, right? Not Baxter, Alfred. Baxter. Ba Baxter. Baxter, right. Uh, so The Stars, My Destination <laughs> is the next book. We're reading one of these every month. So if there is one or more you're interested in joining the discussion for, please consider joining the Patreon forum. And we'll see you in a month. Thank you so much for watching. Bye. 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 Bye.